on the move, always on the move. From here to there, from one place to another, anywhere and everywhere, traveling, migrating, conveying, moving, transporting. On the move, always on the move. But among those millions of people on the move, hundreds of thousands find the exits every year and move away from the masses into the peace and quiet of nature. Americans, Africans, Japanese and Australians discover the beauty of this special place, Hochevelua National Park, a park in which nature and its imagery meet. Hochevelua National Park offers constantly changing scenery with hills, plains and ridges. There's dense growth and open spaces, tall trees and bushes. The park is inhabited by big game and countless small animals and insects. What we see today is really no more than an in-between stage in the millions of years that nature developed freely, followed by a couple of centuries of human interference. Right beneath our feet, we find an immaculate archive of that development, for those who can read it. It shows in great detail how the soil constantly formed, reformed, shifted, subsided, moved and eroded. The present manifestation of the landscape was determined by the penultimate ice age about 150,000 years ago. Ice caps came down from the north, bringing gravel and rocks and pushing up the lower levels and the local soil to hills of sometimes over a hundred meters. Over the years, erosion brought the hills down again until they formed the present rolling landscape. Human occupation, deforestation, erosion and the planting of new trees all left their traces in the soil. The deeper we go to read the archive, the further we go back in time. But this is not only a story about ice and rocks. Animals came and went according to the changing climate. For long periods of time, they would inhabit the land, then move away again on the turns and twists of time and temperature. They too can be traced through the archive. The mammoth, the woolly rhinoceros, the moose, the European bison, they all came and went. One of the archive discoveries that strongly appeals to the imagination is the fossil of a giant elk. With its antlers spanning up to two and a half meters, this animal was the precursor of today's wildlife at Hochevelua. 100,000 years ago, the giant elk inhabited this region, alongside an animal we are better acquainted with, the red deer. A species that has managed to survive the ravages of time so far, as opposed to its giant predecessor. The red deer. The earliest traces of this impressive and majestic animal date back to some 250,000 years ago. Driven away by the rigorous climate of the last ice age, the red deer returned to the region after the ice caps retreated and have remained here ever since. Hochevelua National Park is the habitat of around 250 red deer. They are preeminently gregarious animals living in herds. Most of the time, the males and the females, stags and hinds, lead separate lives.
The red deer is the largest animal in its species known in the Netherlands. It is the national park's figurehead. Hoge Velo is a monument, a monument teeming with life up to the present day. It's a carefully conserved landscape, offering an insight into nature conservation and management from the beginning of the 20th century. This makes it a monument for the Netherlands, a country that has known large-scale change, urban development and adaptation to modern times. Hoge Velo National Park, the largest nature reserve in the Netherlands, is private property. It's the legacy of people whose name will always be connected to it, Mr. and Mrs. Krollen Muller. Helene Muller was born in Essen, Germany in 1869, daughter of a rich shipowner and merchant. At 19, she met the brother of her father's Dutch business partner. His name was Anton Kroller. They were married in 1888. A few years later, Helena's father died and Anton's brother fell seriously ill. Suddenly, Anton found himself in charge of a company that would become one of the largest Dutch multinationals of that era, making vast sums of money. This money enabled the couple to realize their main passions. Helena Muller had been a keen art collector from the beginning of their marriage, and Anton Kroller was a passionate hunter. In 1909, they acquired a scenic area of 6,000 hectares in the eastern part of the Netherlands called Hoge Veluwe. Its dense forests, hills and sand drifts were inhabited by rabbits, boars and deer, and later on by wildlife imported by the owners. It was an ideal place for Anton Kroller, lover of the chase. The entire grounds were fenced off with 40 kilometers of fence. Inside it, Helena Muller and Anton Kroller created their own paradise, an ideal world in which all parts should form one harmonious whole. The Dutch author, Dan Dollard, witnessed the creation of the hunting grounds as a young man. Ik heb dat namelijk als uh, kleine jongen hier logerende op Hoenderlo, heb ik dat voor het eerste gemerkt in 1912, 1913. Want ik plegde daar rond te zwerven over, bijvoorbeeld over die eindeloze vlakte van buntgras, die nou in de wandeling de Moeflon vlakte genoemd wordt. En koerste dan het reemster zand in en daar zaten nogal konijnen. En daar joeg ik dan op met eigen gemaakte pijl en boog. Sloeg ik weer die weg in vanuit de stichting Hoenderlo op, uh, op het terrein waarvan ik dan logeerde. En ineens dacht ik: hé, hey, ik kan niet verder. Want daar waren werkelijk bezig een wildraster op te richten. En niet zomaar een kleintje. Het raster dat er vandaag nog staat, het is 2,25 meter hoog. En dan de bovenijzers zijn er binnen gebogen. En dan, en dan twee rijen prikkeldraad. Right up to the present day, the park seems to derive its identity from the fence surrounding it. Like guards at the gate, three gatehouses were built to offer the visitors access to the grounds. A contest among young Dutch architects in 1994 determined their looks. The gatehouses give access to a unique wildlife reserve containing some monumental buildings and a collection of sculptures, representing the finest art produced in the past century and a half in this country and beyond. The scenery at Hoge Veluwe is unique in its sort, because it has been managed in exactly the same way for almost a century now. As early as 1921, Anton Kroller bought a herd of mouflons and left them to graze between the heather bushes like sheep. 
combined with the grazing activities by roes and deer and the rooting about of boars, this creates specific mosaics in the vegetation, offering smaller animals a suitable habitat. As a result of this continuity and management, Hoche Velewa offers a wide variety of grasshoppers, butterflies, spiders, reptiles and amphibians. The wealth of insect life is one of Hoche Velewa's finest treasures. This beautifully coloured male spider leaves its hole in the ground on warm spring days. The ladybird spider. Ladybird spiders are a highly endangered species and one of the prettiest spiders in the animal kingdom. The males can grow to 16 millimetres in length, the females to 10. The food chain of eating and being eaten is a complex one. If one element from the chain disappears, the consequences are incalculable. The role played by even the smallest little scrapers on the ground cannot be overestimated. The mites, the wood lice, the springtails, the centipedes and millipedes, they are literally the basis of our own existence. Each species has its own speciality. There are hunters and herbivores, cleaners and scavengers, root eaters and blood suckers, mold eaters, body snatchers, burying beetles, cannibals and dung eaters. To birds and other larger animals, they are good prey before those animals in turn fall prey to others. But eating can also be a more charming affair. The remarkable butterfly species inhabiting the park go for the nectar and the varied flora. Heath fritillaries owe their name to the gleaming silvery spots underneath their wings. They are a rare species that needs a lot of nectar to develop their eggs and to procreate. The green hair streak is noticeably less active than most other daytime butterflies. They spend a large part of the day sitting in the sun among the vegetation. If they fly at all, it will be briefly. They find their food mostly in hawthorns, carberry bushes and bramble bushes. The marsh gentian is the main source of food for a wonderful and rare little butterfly, the alcon blue. The plant acts not only as food supplier but also as delivery room. The butterflies lay their eggs on this plant. This makes the Alcon Blue totally dependent on the presence of marsh gentians for completing its life cycle. However, the park isn't only available to animals, rare or not. It also invites man to rediscover and feel his place in nature. Somewhere to take a breather, far away from the pressures of daily life. 
Enjoy the walks, the scenery, the moving perspectives, the minutest details of the vegetable and animal kingdom. Be impressed by the peace and quiet, and when you leave, take some of it home with you to help you see your day-to-day -day worries in a new light. There's no way you can miss it. Right in the middle of the park is St. Hubert's Hunting Lodge, a monumental building commissioned by the Kroller Müllers and built by their then private architect Berlache. It's a large brick country house whose function wasn't so much to be a residence as a leisure castle. The hunting lodge too was part of the imagery of nature to its owners. The lodge, the lake, the garden and the surrounding park form a harmonious and perfect unity. Helena Krola Müller called the tower a mighty symbol of mind rising above matter. When Berlacher designed the house, he portrayed in many of its aspects the legend of St. Hubert, patron saint of hunting and huntsmen. Anyone who is familiar with this legend can read the house like a book. In his younger years, the affluent Hubert was someone who readily enjoyed the pleasures of life. A passionate huntsman, he decided to skip mass on one of the Christian holy days and went hunting instead. Suddenly, a huge stag appeared to him in the forest with a large luminous crucifix between its antlers. Hubert stood still and heard a voice. Unless thou repenteth, thou shalt go to hell. Awestruck, the huntsman fell to his knees and asked the voice what to do. He was told to go and put himself in the care of the Bishop of Maastricht. He heeded the voice, gave all his possessions to the poor and went into the priesthood. He became Bishop of Liège and died in an atmosphere of holiness. The male red deer's impressive appearance is mainly due to its antlers. A number of factors contribute to large and good-looking antlers. Genetics, a good condition, proper nutrition, little disturbance and good weather. Deer shed their antlers annually. In February or March, the bone cells at the base of the antlers soften, causing the branches to fall off. New skin will start to grow immediately on the planes of fracture. The new antlers begin to grow. The antlers sprout from the frontal bones on the deer's forehead. During the months of growth, the branches are covered with velvet, fine-haired skin with many small veins that rapidly transport the growth substances. After about four months, the antlers are fully grown. At the end of this period, towards July, the velvet loses its function and dies off. This brings on itching and irritation and causes the deer to rub off the now useless velvet skin against trees and bushes until it hangs in rags on the antlers. Helena Kruller went on collecting art. The harmonious combination of art and nature played an important role in their lives. The love of art was instilled in Helena Kruller by art historian H.P. Bremer, whose course in art contemplation she attended. Bremer also became her main advisor for purchasing art. Then Donald said, She was herself not a knappe vrouw. Her man was geen Adonis, maar die had het geld. En dat vergoed veel. Maar zij had dat in de 19e eeuw in vele kringen overheersende esthetische idee. Dat samen gaat met kunst het hogere. En de natuur voor haar was ook iets waar je af en toe zegt. Oh wat is dat prachtig ik val mijn handen. 
En dan vergat ze natuurlijk de fabriekscheurstenen en de walm van de roer waar haar centen vandaan kwamen. Maar het totaal resultaat is toch iets merkwaardigs en een grote verrijking van dit overigens wat landschappen betreft dikwijls zo armzalig geworden Nederland. It is mainly the imagery of nature, as presented in the work of Vincent van Gogh, that appealed strongly to Helena Krolle-Muller. When I look at van Gogh's lemons, in my imagination I place a few lemons as I see them next to his. Then I sense a world of difference. It's a question of intuition, but once you understand van Gogh's depth, you can see heaven in the way he portrays a lemon. All great artists draw the viewer's attention to the perfect. Art never lies. Art is pure truth. Art is emotion, and emotion is always real. Helena Kroller-Muller built her own ideal world around her. She was always looking for heavenly harmony and images of the perfect life in everything around her. In the art she bought, depicting images of nature, in the house she had built, in real nature, in the park surrounding her. We should approach each work of art with respect. Each one is an image of the human soul, and if we understand it correctly, it will reveal many things to us that would remain hidden if we were to draw exclusively from our own sources. The best one is the olive grove. It's so soft and profound, and such a complete, large painting. I can't describe it to you, but I'm sure to most people this is the most beautiful painting of all, because there is nothing in it to disturb you. I do not collect art for the present possession of it, for that would not make me a collector. With my collection, I think of the future, and I try to determine whether it would stand the test of time. I collect art in order to give to the future that which I deem to be best in life, the only thing with any true value.
Helena Kroller Muller was a child of her times, a privileged, wealthy child of her times. But she was also a dominant woman who liked to control her own life and those of others in the greatest detail. As clockmaker, so you this beeld kunnen gebruiken dat ze eigenlijk heeft geprobeerd met dit monument, met dit kasteel, de tijd stil te zetten. Het is zo'n eenheid vanaf het ontwerp. En dat moet zo blijven. Iedereen doet pogingen om wat het nu nog is, om het te conserveren en om het te behouden. Om het zo te laten blijven zoals zij dat bedoeld heeft. Alle kamers blijken deze, of vrijwel alle kamers, hebben dus klokken. Er zijn natuurlijk wat uh, vrijere klokken, zoals in de eetkamer en in de, in de bibliotheek. Die mogen op zichzelf staan, maar in alle dienstvertrekken en um, buiten op de binnenplaats, die waren allemaal gekoppeld aan die, aan die centrale moederklok. Daar kon je niet omheen. Ze noemen het dus ook een, een moederklok met slaven. Het is toch een uitdrukking van de macht die je hebt over je werknemers om te zorgen dat alles precies gebeurt zoals jij dat wil. But in the lodge too, time cannot be stopped. Everything looks just the same as Berlacher and Helena Kroller Muller planned it, but the destination has changed. Nowadays, St. Hubert Hunting Lodge is reserved for guests of the Dutch government, and there are tours for visitors to the park. The scenery in the park looks like unspoilt nature, but it isn't. As soon as the area became inhabited in the early Middle Ages, the forest was cut back and thinned out. The heaths were grazed by ever larger flocks of sheep, and sods of peat were cut for fertilization and for heating. The soil became more and more arid, and open patches appeared. Drifting sands that kept spreading. Large parts of the original forest became wild and infertile. Large-scale reforestation of fir trees took place only in the 19th century. But the museum of sceneries that together make up Hoge Veluwe is never finished. At present, we are trying to allow the planted fir tree woods to develop along more natural lines. And where the drifting sands have disappeared, in the former game reserve for instance, they are partly reactivated in order to restore the idea of an old historical landscape and to preserve rare and special plants and animals. There is building up as well as demolishing rejuvenation as well as conservation. These people are painting with axes and saws, with knowledge and insight, and with bare hands. 
Those bare hands often belong to the many volunteers of the society Friends of Hoge Veluwe. Unaware of development and insight into nature conservation, the animals spend their lives in Hoge Veluwe. Nature, in all its manifestations, simply goes its own way. Wild boars are the ruffians of the forest. Omnivores, with a preference for tubers, plant roots, acorns, chestnuts and mushrooms. Scratching and digging for food, they open up the soil so that new trees and bushes get a chance to germinate. The number of piglets in a litter varies from 1 to 12. If there are too many, nature has her own way of dealing with it. The sow has 10 teats, of which only 8 are fully developed. From the start, each piglet has its own teat, which he defends anxiously from his brothers and sisters. If there are 10 piglets, two of them are unlikely to survive. In the first three months, the piglets only feed through suckling. The mother lies on her side so that the piglets can reach the teats more easily. All this wildlife takes place right under the eyes of an observant passerby. In the Netherlands, foxes are the largest predators living in the wild. They are real opportunists when it comes to food and eat those animals that they find locally or the ones that are the most easy to catch. Rabbits, hares, mice, but also birds or worms. Even the odd insect is not rejected. Foxes hunt mainly by smell and their sense of smell is highly developed. For mice though, they use hearing. When hunting mice, they employ an interesting technique. They jump very high and land with front paws and snout on the surprised victim. Young foxes learn the technique of mousing by practicing on each other, on a fly or an imaginary prey. When the vixen is pregnant and just after delivering, she sleeps in an underground shelter, a burrow. This is often a deserted badger's or rabbit's home. A fox's burrow has several entrances spread over a distance. Late September and early October is the time for the most impressive spectacle in the park, the mating season of the red deer, a time many nature lovers look forward to all year.
Here, the primitive howl in the woods, a sign of sexual excitement and a way of impressing competitors. The herds of males lose their coherence. Each of them is now trying to organize a number of hinds in a harem to mate with. But first he will have to defend them against his equally lusty rivals. For the time being, he is forced to remain in one place. His rivals are many and very determined. He may be able to scare off his lesser opponents with his behavior, showing the strength of his antlers and the power of his voice. But if he is up against an equal, it may end in a fierce fight that could last for hours. There can only be one winner. Yet there are seldom serious injuries or deaths to mourn. Eventually one of the fighters gives up and the victor pursues him no further. Year in, year out, hundreds of people come to the park to witness the spectacle from behind nature watch screens. They are careful not to disturb the animals. It's an event that impresses on the visitors the fact that nature keeps up its own unchanging habits. In the early 20s, Anton Kroller faced financial setbacks. They were the heralds of the big crisis that was to hit Europe and America a few years later. In spite of this, Helena Kroller Muller went on working on her greatest ideal in the midst of nature. She wanted to embody the idea even clearer and decided that there should be a museum. Her art collection should become publicly accessible in the middle of the park, at the foot of what was called the French Mountain a monument, a symbol of the unity of visual arts, nature and architecture. Again, she wanted Berlacher to be the architect. But Berlacher felt the bond with the couple had become too personal. Also, he was no longer a match for the domineering attitude of Helena Kroller Muller. He broke the contract with the couple and his place was taken by the Flemish architect, Professor Henri van der Felde. He did not disappoint her. In spite of the high estimated cost, building started in 1921. Oh, the museum is going to be beautiful. You'll be surprised when you see the plans. They by far exceed my expectations, and I believe also anything that has been built or designed in that field. We shall exhibit all drawings and sketches quite beautifully when you are back. The bitter pill I shall let you have in advance. The estimate of the cost has arrived, I read the amount of six million guilders without the terraces. But the times were against them. 
the economic crisis worsened and Anton Kruller lost most of his fortune. There was no money to continue working in the museum. But against better judgment, Helena had people continue with designs and construction plans. The museum building would be our biggest accomplishment. It would be the leading architectural work of our era, but also of times to come for many, many years. In the meantime, I still dream of having an evening when von der Felder explains his plans, because before they are locked away, Sir should see them. When a dead person is buried, he is first adorned. When a museum is buried, it is right to show it just once in its full glory. In 1935, the whole art collection, which by then had become a foundation, was given to the state of the Netherlands, on condition that the building of the museum would be carried out as van der Felder had designed it. But Anton Kruller was not the only one with financial problems, and the national treasury could not bear the cost either. Concrete foundations and numbered building segments spread over the site were the only visible remains of Helena Kroller Muller's wonderful dream. But her dream got a more modest realization. On the 23rd of July, 1938, a museum financed by the state could be opened after all. It was indeed designed by van der Felde, but it was much smaller as a concept and in scale. This museum, once intended as a temporary construction to bridge poor times, was extended in 1950 with a sculpture room and more exhibition rooms. Until today, it is the heart of Hoge Veluwe National Park. In winter, too, the park welcomes its visitors to sledge, skate or cross-country ski on the slopes of the hills. 
but perhaps most of all, to go for a walk and be impressed by the unique and awe-inspiring aspect of nature in her winter sleep. Helena Kruller Müller died in 1939 and Anton Kruller joined her in 1941. Both were buried in the spot they themselves had chosen, on the French hill, where the park extends around them like an endless painting. Elena Kroler Muller saw her art collection as a complete whole. And although the museum continues to buy art, this idea is still, as much as possible, respected. After the Second World War, a new collection of modern sculptures was started, building on Helene's earlier three-dimensional acquisitions. The sculpture garden has become one of the most attractive parts of the National Park. It's a collection that has an international reputation for exhibiting the latest developments in sculptural arts. The Kroler Mullers had a vision. The dream they hope to realize in their lifetime is now reality for everyone who wishes to see and enjoy it. Nature caught in images and imagination. 